Hello everybody, I'm Junior Doan. This is Uncommon Sense. Thank you for joining us. My guest, Jeff Van de Zandy, author of American Poet, a novel, which received the Michigan Notable Book Award in 2013, is a writer of novels, short stories, and poems. He is a professor of English at Delta College, where he teaches fiction writing, screenwriting, and advanced creative writing. He earned his MA in English Literature from Eastern Illinois University and a BS in English from Northern Michigan University. So welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Um, so uh, poems, what, what actually is poetry? That's a, it's a challenging question because I think it's, it's misunderstood. I think some people think it's, it's just rhymed language. And, and I think having, tr trying to make it rhyme often can take away from the poetry of a poem. There's much more going on with the language, but I would say it's definitely carefully chosen language. And I think um, that we don't often encounter with people's use of language. I think our, our everyday use of language is fairly forgettable. <laughs> so the, cho the carefully chosen language that's, that's memorable and in, in through the language invites us somewhere special and to dwell kind of slowly with the language. I also think we're always in such a hurry that sometimes the, uh, the, the uh, dense nature of a poem actually yes. slows us down to live in the poem and to see that these just aren't everyday words. These are words that are asking you to live in a moment. And then, and, and hopefully there's a love of language there by the poet too. There's some surprises in the language and maybe, maybe even a message, but I don't necessarily know that the message has to come first. It, it can, like a piece of music, it can be beautiful first and then it might additionally have insight into life. And there used to be forms you had to do it in, a meter or haiku. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, uh, tell me the difference between a poem and a phrase, because some poems now are just sort of free form. Right. I think um, the, uh, the formless poem that re really we started to get more of after Walt Whitman who uh, broke away from the formed poetry quite a bit. And it's not to say there aren't poets still working in forms. Um, st um, I'm thinking of like, you know, working with couplets, working in sonnets and so forth. But you find a lot more free verse poetry. And that can both be hackneyed and not very good, where it just seems like it's fairly mundane language broken up into lines. And yet, by the same token, it can be very freeing to not have to worry about that and you can make the language do creative things. So I think free verse invites both, uh, both kind of amateurish writing that looks like a poem, but it also can open into some of the best stuff that you're not constricted by the form. I think the form can be constricting. I think it's, I think it's oh. difficult to write a sonnet. And it's not enough just to make sure the right words are rhyming at the end, but uh, if the form takes, Writing in form, I think you should not be aware of the form while you're reading it. And I think sometimes when we write in a form, we're overly aware of the form because of the rhyme scheme and it actually calls too much attention to the form. The best sonnets are sonnets that you don't realize they're sonnets until later you go up and count the lines and go, oh, that was a sonnet. Oh, and the words did rhyme at the end, but they weren't, they weren't um, in your face rhymes. So I don't work in forms very much myself when I write poetry, but I do go for poetic language. Is sound important? I, oh, very important, yeah. I mean, that's some of, what, some of what you're going for. I think some of when my poetry is at its clunkiest is when I'm too caught up in the message and I'm trying to deliver the message and I'm not paying as enough attention to the music or the language. And I think there are some, I mean, there are some people who write even just sound poetry where it's about they see they see words as musical notes that every mm. you know that every word is its own you know we have no other word like sound I mean found rhymes with it but sound is the only one that starts with s so you have these all these every word oh. is its own little magic and then you can make bigger magic by putting the right words together and the sounds play off of each other and and that's why I think like rhyming sound and found actually detracts from the yes. magic because it's so pedestrian yes. of finding other ways that language plays. I'm, I'm often really aware in my 
poetry when vowel sounds repeat, like a, a owl in sound is picked up later by the owl in follow. So they, you hear the sound, but you don't, they don't rhyme, but the owl sound is picked up. And it's, kind of, it's almost kind of like jazz, where a note will yeah. resound for a little bit and be picked up by another note later on. I mean, that's, so that's the kind of music I, I would be looking to do in my poetry, is more the, the sounds of the, the vowels. You write poems <clears throat> and, and actually magazine articles <laughs> and short stories and novels. Um, what, um, um, I, I, what I want to say, what I want to ask is what draws you to one or the other uh, um, um, in, in paying attention? Can you do them simultaneously? Uh, do you decide I have a good idea for a book because I had some unanswered questions in the last book and I'd like to explore whatever? Just talk to me a little bit about, with all the range of talent and ability you have, how you go about fashioning the next, um, I don't want to call it a thing, but the next writing that you're going to do. It, it really depends on what image came to me to, um, to create the work. Uh, with, with American Poet, I drove by the Theodore Retke house in Saginaw after dropping my daughter off at school. And for whatever reason, I looked toward the roof of the house. And in my mind, I imagined a young man up there with a bullhorn. I didn't know what he was doing up there. But the idea came to me, well, maybe I could write the work that will tell me what he was doing up there with that bullhorn. And American Poet actually started as a movie. And I had 30 pages of screenplay. And for me, it wasn't working in as, as a movie, and this is where the form told me what it needed to be. Um, I, I think the movie wasn't visual enough. There were a lot of scenes of, of Denver talking with Haywood in bars, and it was kind of... An interior thought. Yeah, there was a lot. And then I realized, too, the, the, the movie was hamstringing me because I couldn't get into Denver's head. Because yes. when you write for, for screen, you can only deal with what the audience can see and what the audience can hear and you really don't want a clunky voiceover trying to capture the, the character's thoughts. That's kind of a, again, a pedestrian thing to do when you're writing a screenplay is just have your character think aloud in voiceover. So once I realized that, that's once I started writing as a novel, it kind of, the, the idea will tell you or tell me what kind of form it needs to be. I think my, my thinking, I think the reason why I'm writing more screenplays and novels now is my thinking is more narrative. Mm. And so I don't write as many poems. And I think you have, that is a, there's a beauty for me to work in many genres. And it also makes me wonder, could I be excellent at one yes. if I concentrated on that versus being functional at several? And it's really, like you say, the essay writing for, you know, I write for a fly fishing magazine, which tends to be much more straightforward articles and, and the poetry, like we talked about, the attention to language, all of it, each form asks something different of you as a writer to do it well. And I think I get away from the practice as I'm moving around between these different forms. So I think the essay, the screenplay, and fiction still share enough in common that I can kind of bounce between them and, but the poetry has definitely, I wouldn't say it has stopped, but if I write, if I write three poems a year, oh. it's a pretty good year for poetry. And, and it definitely used to be 20 to 25 poems a year when I was only working in that form. It's an interesting question about should you specialize mm -hmm. in order to get better, because writing requires that. Right, I think so. I think, well, like take Retke, I mean, considered a genius in poetry, and that's <clears throat> all he ever wrote. He tried to do other things. He tried to, because Retke was, you know, he was a conflicted, conflicted man for sure, and he really wanted to make money from his writing too. So as much of a genius as he was, he was, he was much as bogged down in capitalism and money as anybody is, where you want success too, from what you do. So he would try to write children's books. And he would try. He would try his hand at plays and fiction because he thought that's where the money was. He knew the money wasn't in poetry, and yet that's what he always ended up going back to because that's where his genius was. So I wonder, like he'll be remembered always as a genius, where I'll probably be for, 
forgotten as somebody who was functional at several forms of writing, but uh. it makes you wonder. I, I see it as a gift because being able to bounce from these different genres, I'm almost always working on something. Yes. And I don't have to give up ideas where I think if I was just writing poetry and a, a long idea came to me, it'd be like, well, that'd be a good idea for a novelist, but I don't do that. Yes. And I think I'd have to shelve a lot more of my ideas. It gives you choice. Yes. Yeah. It gives and me, range. gives me the choice to be mediocre at many genres. <laughs> well, you don't know that. And I <laughs> love your book. Well, thank you. In any case, um, for myself, I, I like to read, you know, <laughs> like with something in my hand. But I also like movies. But if I go to a movie, it's one experience. If I see it on my little screen, it flattens right out. So I've been asking myself, how much is it the, the content, the con, not the content, but the context? Do you need surround? I mean, is screenwriting counting on that? Or are they counting on it's more like television, you see it on a small screen? I think I would imagine you're writing for, the, for a bigger screen when you're writing, um, that you're imagining, like, how will that hit the audience when they have that huge image. And I'm often telling, I'm teaching an intro to screenwriting class right now on, on Mondays, and I'm telling my students, the words don't matter. The words are just a symbol of what's going to be on the screen. So there's no metaphors, there's no similes, there's no importance to making the language beautiful. Screenwriting shares a lot more in common with technical writing than it does with, with fiction. Both are trying to tell a story, but in screenwriting, it's just a blueprint for what will eventually be on a screen. And there's actors and set designers and directors and producers who will actually bring the thing to life. So the, the, the screen play is just the Frankenstein body. The movie is the directors and everybody else pumping the electricity and it that brings it to life. And How is it mechanical when you say it's quite mechanical? Um, as far as the language, especially like the language, you're, you're not... You don't have to bog yourself down in description. When you're, it's just real functional description. He walked into the room, he looked around, he left the room. An actor will decide how the looking around looks. A director will say, this is the look I want on your face when you look around the room. So the screenwriter is just kind of imagining vaguely what the, set, the setting will look like, but it's the others who bring it to life. And in fiction, it's all on you. Like your words are the camera too. You're trying to create an image in your in your reader's mind, whereas it's always known when you're writing a screenplay. This will you know nobody will read this for enjoyment. It will be created into something that will be watched for enjoyment. So I'm often telling my students, don't write the words that create the scene. Close your eyes, imagine the scene on a screen. Now transcribe the words that make that scene, but start with the image and then the words. The words don't create the image, the image was created and you wrote the words that would make, hopefully help somebody else see what you imagined when you closed your eyes. That's really interesting. It's difficult too because yes. a lot of my students who take intro to screenwriting had me for fiction. And uh, you're talking a different game. Right. What do you call talk, what do you tell them then? Well I tell them really straight up on the first day that give up some of the notions of how language is going to function here in terms of, you know, we're often talking about the difference between screenwriting and fiction writing, the difference of, because in my fiction class I'm always saying, keep the camera on, you know, write those sentences that help us see the scene, you know, and, and there's no, like, in fiction a student might write, you know, she looked away from her desk and out the window a small bird flitted on the lines, as she thought about it for a while before she went back to her computer screen. That's way too much for screenwriting. Um, it, it's almost too directing. Like, mm -hmm. I think a director would feel like, I'll decide what she sees out the window. Unless the bird is symbolically important for some reason, it's bogging it down too much. You're probably more like the line, likely the line would be, she worked at her computer, her husband walked in and the dialogue would start. And if the director felt he wanted her to be looking around or anything, that would be up to him or her to, to decide that. So Am I understanding from what you're saying that layers of meaning in fiction can be written down, but layers of meaning for screenwriting are added by the costumes, the director, the actor, the lighting, and the music? 
you're not in complete control of all the details as a screenwriter. It's yeah. not to say you're not thinking at all in terms of symbolic significance, metaphor. You're trying in a way through words to best kind of give a sense of what you think will be on the screen, but in the end, you won't have much say in it. Often, I mean, uh, uh, from an industry kind of point of view, the arrangement is you write the screenplay, somebody buys it, and then often they don't want to hear from you anymore. Oh my gosh. I mean, they might even say, we love the story. Your dialogue is terrible. We're going to buy the story. We're going <laughs> to hire another screenwriter to make the dialogue better. Well, what about me? I'll make the dialogue better. No, we've already seen how you make dialogue. It's not very good, but you have a good story here. And, you know, screen, there's, that's another thing too, is there's so much ownership with fiction. And you have to go into screenwriting knowing it will be collaborative. Right. And that many people will have Cannot their hands. Do that. And you have to be open to suggestions. Letting I think go. even more so. Yes. Now, I, I read once that you said you were compelled to write. Uh, what does that mean? I mean, did you wake up at seven years old and decide to write? Well, my dad was a writer. Oh. And he taught at Northern Michigan University and he taught creative writing. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, good. So I think I grew up differently than a lot of people in that Saturday mornings at our house, we were to keep quiet because dad had his four hours in the morning to work on his books. He, he, he unlike me, my, my dad needed a pretty controlled environment to work, so he didn't write at work. He didn't, you know, for myself, I'm often writing from 11 to 1 in the morning because that's when I have time to write. It's getting harder as I'm getting older to do that, yeah. but that's, you know, American poet. I, I was often working on that till 1. And, and when the writing was going well, sometimes I'd look and be, look and think, God, it's 2.30 in the morning. I have to get up at 5.50. I have to walk away from this. But Saturday mornings, um, my father would be, uh, my Saturday mornings were soundtracked by typewriter keys. He was working on his books. So I think in a natural kind of son kind of way, I figured, oh, well, that's what boys do. So I'm going to work on stories too. And I think I, I noodled around at them as a young kid. And then in high school, I didn't write at all because that was my rebellion. Uh. You know, I'm not going to be like him. I'm going to not have an interest. And I didn't read much. And I think some of that, I don't know how much of an active rebellion it was, but I didn't yes. embrace what he was all about until I got back into my 20s. And then I guess my rebellion was to write poetry where he wrote fiction. So I'm not totally, because you know, people would often say, not meaning to be insulting, but you took it strange when people say, oh, okay, following in dad's footsteps, huh? And I'd be, well, not exactly. He's never had a poem published. You know, I, <laughs> I work in poetry. And then eventually I came to terms with all that and started writing fiction in my, my late 20s. But that, I think, set up the groundwork that want, wanting to write. And, and I write right now because I can't not write. Sometimes I'd rather not write. Um, Denver talks about that in American Poet. Wouldn't it be nice if you just didn't have the urge? Because it's kind yes. of, in a way, it's a bizarre thing that most people don't understand. Why do you do that? And, and especially, I feel, for young writers, just starting out. I had a very supportive household, obviously. Dad was very happy when I was writing. I'm willing to discuss. Right. But I think of my, a lot of my writers here at Delta, they, their family doesn't understand why they do it. And you have to justify it even more if you're not making any money from it. And success yes. comes so, you know, it often comes after years and years and years of practice. And through all those years, you feel alone, haunted not only by the, the voice in your head saying, this isn't going anywhere, but the voices all around you saying, why are you wasting your time like that? You could have a job. You know how much you could be making if you were even just at McDonald's yeah. putting in the same hours? So there's a, you have this compulsion and then nobody understands it. And I, I think it's, or not many people. Painful. Do. Right. And I think that's why a lot of my students, when they get to fiction class, form fast friendships because they look around and say, I'm not a freak. <laughs> there's yeah. others who want to do this too. And yeah, so I think having that supportive environment helped. A great deal. Yeah, even though I rebelled against it sometimes. It was, it was never unnatural. It was never questioned. And my wife, Jenny's very, she understands why I stay up late and, and work on the writing too. And, and she understood it even when I wasn't getting things published and it didn't seem like it was going to amount to much. And I think that's important too for any artist is to kind of surround himself or herself. So with. she never put pressure on you about, as a friend of mine said, show me the money. 
Well, sometimes we'll be watching like Oprah and she'll have a, a really big author on and they'll be talking about her book and it's really clear that the book is selling a lot and she'll look at me jokingly and say, why can't you write books like that? <laughs> <laughs> but I write, you know, I write the books I can write and, and she's just joking when she says yes. that. She understands that. Do I you have to write so much a day or it's just whatever the theme is as you're working on it, it draws you forward? If I'm working on a novel, I, I work on it every day. I try to, but if you're staying up till 1.30 in the morning yeah. every night and getting up at 5.50 to get kids ready, you gotta take a night off every now and then. While I was working on American Poet, I had a cot in my office at Delta, and in between classes, if I wasn't working on papers, I would catch a quick hour's nap to kind of give me a little fuel for that night. So when I'm in it, and it's going well, it's everything. Can anyone be taught how to write well? I, I think, I don't know if you can teach creativity. I don't know if you can teach somebody to have something to say. You can't teach experience. You can teach, like I teach the elements of fiction. I teach students that their characters need to have a conflict. I teach them that they need to reveal their characters rather than tell us who they are. If their character has a bad temper, we need to see a scene with the character having a bad temper versus an expository sentence like Bill was always getting mad and that's not fiction that's that's an essay um, I can teach how to write decent dialogue I, I can teach the elements of fiction but I can't necessarily make them bring all those elements together and that's what they try to and they bring their story to class and then we talk about the story and we try to make it better but you wonder with some student and some will end up with a good um, with a good final product, but it does leave you wondering, could they, can they now arrive at a similar final product more on their own and not needing a half hour workshop where 15 people are telling them, well, you could try this or you could do that and, and so forth. And those are the students I think who make it are the ones who continue to write after the class and they don't need that heavy workshop setting. Did you need the heavy workshop? I did not take, I only took two creative writing classes. I'm, oh, really? Tell me. Uh, I, took, I took Introduction to Fiction from my father. Oh, my goodness. What a <laughs> so, story. Yeah. So my A in there is pretty suspect. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> I look back. work harder, though. Yeah. Uh, actually, he was kind of a softie. So um, I, uh, I've, I've read the stories that I wrote in my class. They're not very good. But I was just starting out. And I took a poetry class. I suppose I also took a screenwriting class. It was years later, and it was an online class through a school in New York because I wanted to bring a screenwriting class to Delta. Do you feel teaching sucks it out of you, like you have in the book, that you give everything to students? It can be a mix, for sure. It can energize you. There's, there's, I teach fiction at night in the winter, and there's sometimes when I leave and if the discussion was good and, and I got myself fired up about fiction, I want to work on something. And other times I'm drained and I'm sick of writing and I feel like a bricklayer who goes home and has to work on his own patio. It's like, eh, I don't need a patio, I'll just watch TV. <laughs> and there's many nights that, because I'm, I'm steeped in How writing. How do you keep yourself fresh? I take breaks. I'm not writing anything right now. I've written some articles in support of American Poet. I, 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 t I write a regular fly fishing short story for the Cedar Sweeper magazine, which is a Michigan-only magazine for fly fishing. But there's not a lot of pressure there. I mean, he just says, here's the word count. Give me kind of an interesting story. And I actually, I like the freedom of that. So I, I think maybe I keep myself fresh by bouncing around with some little projects. Before, I mean, I have a novel in my head. I'm, I know the premise, but I also know the amount of work. And, but I mean, I, I can I can see the the cover of the novel. I already know it's going to be called Michigan. That'll be the Michigan, a novel, and it's about a it's about a grandson who's driving his grandfather around to see his estranged sons, who he had a very difficult relationship with. And the, the grandfather's name, I already know his name is Otto, O-T-T-O, -T -T -O, but he's kind of a metaphor for the auto industry. Oh. And kind of, so uh, without being, Sound. hopefully nobody would know that like right away. Yes. So maybe this part of the interview will be a race. No, I'm just kidding. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, you're, you're a very sensitive fellow. 
you know, and I'm sure you uh, really think hard um, and um, about the process of living and relationships. You couldn't have written <coughs> what you wrote without some thought about that and sensitivity to it. I think that's that's probably an inherent part of any artist. Is observation? Is, yeah. obs and turned up sensitivity. You know, I think that's why we have a lot of alcoholic artists and drug abusing artists and whatnot. Is I think that is a way to to temper their high sensitivity. It it actually kills it a little bit. So not having to to live like an open wound. And I'm not saying I live like an open wound, right. but your Hemingways, your Red right. Keys, your Sylvia Plaths. I mean, their sensitivity was turned way up. And I almost think, does the genius go up with it? Is that part of it? Interesting question. Interesting question. Well, we've had a wonderful time, Jeff and I. And I, Jeff and me. Jeff and I or Jeff and me? Anyway, Definitely. I have to end the program. <laughs> Let me just say, um, what I liked about it is he grew out of a family, or at least a father who wrote. He was very wise to try it differently into poetry. He came back to that. He combined teaching with it. And he's, he's very thoughtful about his students, and he's very thoughtful about his, uh, his life. And the, just the last few seconds when we were talking about heightened awareness, and it's almost too much and how you have to dampen it down in some people. And that already he's, he's taken with ideas and he can just put it together in a new novel. So go out, you know what, how I ever close every single time, go out and do something sweet and wonderful and kind for someone you know and someone you don't know. And please, please do it again the day after and the day after and the day after. And I look forward to seeing you the very next time when we start another segment of Uncommon Sense. To contact Junia, send her an email at info at juniadone.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadone.com. Thanks for joining us. See you next time for Uncommon Sense with Junior Doan.